Welcome back. You now know what a Turing machine is, what its basic components are, and how it operates. You know how the imitation game goes, and you understand Turing's basic proposal. He suggests that we throw away what he thinks is a hopelessly confused and metaphysically bloated question, can machines think? He proposes to replace that intractable question with one that has easily defined terms and an observable answer. Can a machine play the imitation game? I hope you can see the influence of behaviorists and of Ryle in the strategy that Turing is suggesting. As to the outcome, here's Turing's prediction from 1950. He writes, I believe that in about 50 years time, it will be possible to program computers with a storage capacity of about 10 to the 9th, to make them play the imitation game so well that an average interrogator will not have more than a 70% chance of making the right identification after five minutes of questioning. So Turing predicts that by the year 2000, machines will be able to fool people at least 30% of the time. This didn't happen. And this is so despite the fact that Turing vastly underestimated how much computing power we'd have available to us. 10 to the 9th is about 1 billion bits of data or about 15 million bytes on a 64-bit machine. That is, Turing predicted that by the year 2000, machines could have as much as 15 megabytes of storage. In fact, the video lessons you're watching average around 500 megabytes each, and each of you is likely carrying around a computing device with a storage capacity of 8 to 500 gigabytes, trillions of bytes, and with processing speeds far beyond what Turing could have envisioned. So the fact of the matter is, Turing's prediction has not yet been borne out. Is the problem that he just underestimated how much computing power would be needed to play the imitation game? Or is the problem more basic? The objections that Turing considers are aimed at showing the latter, that there's a principled reason that machines can't ever play the imitation game. Turing considers nine objections, but I wanna highlight just four of them. Objection three, the mathematical objection, suggests that machines have formal limits on what they can do that minds did not. Turing himself had shown that there are some problems that are not computable in the special use of that term that's at stake in computational theory. And Kurt Gödel proved in 1931 that any formal axiomatic system that's sufficiently powerful to represent arithmetic can't be proven to be both complete and consistent. But human beings can represent truths of arithmetic and we can prove them. So doesn't that show that machines have limits we don't? Some philosophers have thought that this objection is extremely powerful, but most philosophers and later researchers in artificial intelligence have thought that this objection is question begging because it assumes that human thinking has no limits. Why think that? Turing supposes that we have no justification to assume that whatever limits there are on machines don't also apply to us, even if they're hard to discern. Moreover, those mathematical results only show that no single machine can do everything, but the same can be said of people. The mathematical objection attempts to establish in principle what the arguments from various disabilities, number five, does by enumeration. Identify something that people can do that machines can't. That is, to identify some sense in which the machines have disabilities that people do not. Turing argues that the arguments from various disabilities invariably turn out to fall into either one of two traps. Like the mathematical objection, they assume that there's some special or magical capacity that humans have and machines do not, or else they turn out to be versions of the argument from consciousness. For example, he says, the claim that machines can't genuinely enjoy strawberries turns out to be an objection that the machine can't have certain conscious sensations, such as sensations of pleasure. So let's look at objection four, the argument from consciousness. Turing writes, this argument appears to be a denial of the validity of our test. According to the most extreme form of this view, the only way by which one could know for sure that a machine thinks is to be the machine and to feel oneself thinking. The idea is that, on the assumption that consciousness is not something that's detectable by the test, that is, not revealed in verbal behavior, then the only way to know that something has conscious experience is to be that thing. This idea is familiar to us from Descartes, Avicenna, and Nagel. In response, Turing argues that this notion of consciousness as private or inner in a way that can't be revealed by behavioral tests 
implies solipsism. Solipsism is the view that I'm the only thinking thing. That is, anyone who's a solipsist holds that they themselves are the only conscious thinking being. They are each the only mind that they can know, so they have no justification for believing that there are any other minds. But solipsism is a weird view and rarely endorsed outright. There's a famous story about a woman who wrote to the philosopher Bertrand Russell and said, solipsism is such an attractive view, why aren't there more of us? So Turing concludes that people should accept his test rather than accept solipsism. Finally, let's talk about objection six, Lady Lovelace's objection. Lady Ada Byron, Countess of Lovelace, was the estranged daughter of the poet, Lord Byron, and she's often credited with writing the very first computer program. An early programming language, Ada, was named after her, and for next week I'm asking you to read a bit of a graphic novel about her life. For this objection, Turing recalls a reflection that Lovelace made about mechanical computers, namely that they can never originate anything. Such a machine, she says, can do whatever we know how to order it to perform, but nothing more. Here we can distinguish two forms of the objection. One, which is more psychological or epistemological, says that computing machines will never behave in ways that are novel in the sense of surprising us or doing things that are unexpected. Turing already anticipated that machines could surprise us, however, and nowadays we have plenty of evidence that machines can behave in surprising and unanticipated ways, for better and for worse, from Watson to Deep Blue to airplane flight systems. The second form of the objection is more metaphysical. It contrasts the mechanical operation of the computing machine with the operation of human minds thought of as non-mechanical, as spontaneous, creative, and free. But as with the mathematical objection, the question arises as to whether human creativity and will are really spontaneous and uncaused. Is human ingenuity really the power to create something from nothing? If so, how does that work? Turing doubts that human beings have this miraculous power and therefore doubts that its absence in computing machines counts as a special disability for them. Just for comparison, take a look at objection nine, the argument from ESP. Turing takes this objection seriously. I mention this to highlight that Turing's not assuming that the world is entirely mechanical or physical. He's just arguing that it doesn't make sense to think of minds or intelligence as private or inaccessible in a way that could never be revealed in behavior. If we're going to take minds seriously, then he thinks that we have to take seriously that they'll make a difference in the world. Otherwise, we're back at solipsism.